Good evening. Good morning. <laughs> Wherever you are in the world, uh, my name is Debbie Bird Smith, and you're on In His Live. And tonight we have a very, very special guest, um, Xavier Aral, who is here, and he's going to talk to us uh, about some of the things that we've been experiencing in our world. It's been pretty crazy. I always say everything's upside down and backwards right now. And, um, um, you know, we, we need to know more and more about what was prophesied and and what we can uh, expect to see in the future. Um, and so welcome, Xavier. I'm so happy to see you. Hello, Debbie. Very nice to see you. Thank you very much for having had the kindness of inviting me. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm just thrilled to have you here. And, and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with Xavier. He's been on all over the place uh, talking on, on many channels. And uh, we're just thrilled to have him here on uh, in his will. Um, Xavier, probably one of the reasons he's been asked, he's he's written this incredible book uh, called Revelations, and uh, it has many, many uh, uh, stories and, and information about many apparitions, some that we may not be very familiar with. But tonight we're going to talk about some of the ones that we are more familiar with and uh, what that means and what's going on in the world and what's going to happen. So please, Xavier. Fill us in. <laughs> well, uh, indeed. Um, as I always uh, begin uh, with my shows uh, that well, that I'm invited in, I just like to bring to uh, your auditor's attention to the fact that there is much, much more than an interview, than a social event. This is truly um, a discussion of a very serious and I would say a grave moment in history. This must not be transformed into a living room conversation, but rather in, a, I would say, in a sort of a mark point uh, for our lives in the sense that heaven has manifested itself again and again, even recently, uh, to humanity, very much like in Fatima, in La Salette and other places, to echo a, or rather an urgent, a very urgent call to conversion. Um, those messages, or this, those calls of conversion, are accompanied with a more serious admonition, a warning of sorts. The warning is this. Humanity has once again reached a zenith of um, upheaval, of uh, sin, of uh, gravity in the shape and uh, fashion of its society. The Catholic Church, we have been told, we have been warned, has been infiltrated. And today, every Roman Catholic who is of good faith uh, cannot help but to observe literally the civil war that is taking place throughout the world whether it is in the Vatican or most recently here in the United States, we can see it very clearly. Would it be only by uh, listening and uh, hearing about the, the exchange of the crossing of blades between Rome and uh, the Bishop of Tyre, um, uh, His Excellency, the Bishop uh, Strickland? No, this is the perfect example as to what the church is going through today. A church... Uh, whose uh, deposit of faith has been defended uh, twice, uh, in two mil millennia rather, uh, with a new politic, a new, shall we say, a new vision, which till now has been totally foreign, I would say even, to a certain extent, contradictory to what our fathers and their fathers were, were taught or knew of our faith and of its church, of their church. What are we to do? What has heaven been telling us through heaven's very first emissary, the Blessed Virgin Mary? And that's what uh, I am planning to discuss with you today. Uh, I would say, uh, after, after having worked with uh, uh, Reverend Father René Laurentin, René Laurentin, en français, in French, who became later on uh, Monsignor, before he passed away in 2017, um, 
I have come to gather a certain baggage of experience, you could say, although by no stretch of the imagination <laughs> can um, my uh, experience ever be compared, not even in a fraction, with that of this extraordinary man who was Father René Laurentin. However, in those few years I worked with him, I was able to observe, to exchange quite a few conversations, a man who was uh, extremely devoted to the Virgin Mary, who with me had a great deal of difference uh, in matters of uh, age. Uh, we came from two different uh, generations. But there was one thing that get, got us very much uh, uh, in common, our background and our bringing. Uh, Father Laurentin, uh, whom the Americans uh, called the foremost expert in Marine Apparition Site, they used to call him the Jacques Cousteau of Marine Apparition Site because he even looked like Jacques Cousteau. No, he spoke with him, even uh, somewhat dressed like him. Uh, Father Laurentin used always to begin his chats whenever he was interviewed with the following statement. Uh, the statement was this. No Catholic, no true up marine apparition sites can bring forth any new teaching which is not already in the Gospels. It's not already in the Holy Scriptures. Everything has been told in the Gospels, in that, in the dogma of the faith, we have everything. However, the Blessed Virgin Mary has been sent again and again to repeat the same message that she gave her contemporary fellow man in a little village in uh, Israel called Cana. The message was this. Do everything he tells you. A son. One wonders, particularly when one uh, takes a step backwards, as why? Why does heaven send the mother of God again and again to echo a same message of warning, a same message of admonition? Why? One is forced to wonder. I think that for our contemporary times, for the times we live in, what was uh, the most relevant messages begin in 1846 in the apparition of La Salette, apparition singular. For there was only one apparition of the Virgin Mary to uh, Melanie Calva, who was then a little girl and little boy, Maximin Giraud. This was the beginning for our times of everything. Then, and I will go into it uh, more and more in depth in a moment, but from then on, uh, this message of uh, La Salette, after it had been formally approved by the local Archbishop of Grenoble, and then confirmed by uh, an approval of the Dicasterium of the Doctrine of the Faith in Rome, by declaring it as being worthy of belief, that particular or rather those secrets of La Salette, because they were not particularly convenient to the clergy, to the authorities of the church then, nor for the future ones to come, and politically were hidden, hidden in an iron box and sent to be forgotten in the depths of the libraries of the Vatican, only to be found over a century later by, in, by sheer accident, by the way, by a French abbot, a French priest called the Corteville, who remarkably enough happened to be a uh, assistant and colleague of Reverend Father René Laurentin, who was not yet named uh, Monsignor. From La Salette, after the discovery of the secrets of La Salette, which we will discuss, there were Tilly another approved apparition site in Normandy, my country of birth, where I'm from. No? And from Tilly came years later Fatima, which also, as we all know, has been formally approved by the local Archbishop of Fatima and by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. But it doesn't stop there. Oh, no. The Virgin Mary decided to continue, or rather was sent by heaven yet again in other approved apparition sites, Banneux, in Belgium, Bora again in, in Belgium, all approved. Then afterwards, in the 1970s, in Japan, on the other side of the planet, in a little place called 
Akita, which was also approved by the local archbishop and by the congregation of the doctrine of the faith, Akita, which, as I will explain to you in a moment, was extraordinary as it was a continuation of Fatima, and which, this by the aberration and the lies that the Catholic Church has perpetrated regarding the third secret, has nevertheless been able, through Sister Sasagawa from Akita, to echo yet the third secret of Fatima. We'll go into that in detail in a moment. Was it, was it the only things, the only places where the Virgin may appear or no? The Virgin appeared yet in other places which have not yet been approved, but neither condemned, and which are still pending to a final pronouncement of their local archbishop. I'm referring myself particularly of Garabandal. And there are other places as well where our Lord, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and Our Lady, and even angels and archangels continue to appear to mystics, including to men of the cloth, like one that takes place today in Quebec, French-speaking region of Quebec, in Canada. And there was one which unquestionably, with Fatima, forms one of the cornerstone of the Mayan apparition history, which is a, to stigmatist, well-renowned stigmatist, Marie-Julie Janny. I'm going to try to, sound, to pronounce it properly with an English accent, Mary Julie Jahini. I think that's how the Americans and the English pronounce her name. But her apparition case was extraordinary. And beside my book, I do not, I only know of another in English that was written or rather translated, which was from the Marquis de la Franquerie. The Marquis de la Franquerie was Marie-Julie Jani, uh, advisor and biographer. He was unquestionably uh, the person who uh, brought to light, to public light, that is, of the messages and prophecies and admonitions brought forth to this extraordinary Briton woman from France, uh, who began to receive her apparitions in the 1870s, all the way to the 1940s, or rather, until her death mm -hmm. in 1941, during the German occupation of France. But remarkably enough, her apparitions, and in my book, it occupies unquestionably the largest amount or the largest number of pages. Her messages are remarkable. Her prophecies from 1870 to till today, and those that are yet to happen, or rather, from 1817 till 2023, all the predictions have taken place with utmost precision. None were proven wrong so far. So this is the reason why um, I started writing this book, uh, principally to bring forth those messages, including beginning with La Salette, whose message, as you're about to find out, is terrifying. Terrifying. But what gives it most credibility and what forces us to pay attention to is the fact that it has been formally approved by all the competent and relevant church and ecclesiastical authorities of the time, the local archbishop and the dicasterium of the doctrine of the faith in the Vatican. There is no greater or superior manner to get a formal approval of the Catholic Church. Now, as Father Laurentin always used to begin, the only thing the Catholic Church may declare about an apparition site is that it is only worthy of belief. That's the approval given by the Church in the Vatican to Fatima, to La Salette, to Baneux, Bohin, to Akita and to others before that. So what does it mean? It does not mean that we as Catholics must obligatorily believe in the authenticity of, of Fatima or Lourdes or, um, or Akita or any of those approved apparition sites. No, it is not a sin not to put importance on those or not to follow them. The church merely declares it would be beneficial for your soul to do so. It is worthy of belief but you don't have to. Now, if the Catholic Church would have 
condemned and approved a, uh, an, a, an apparition site, no, then it would be a sin to continue talking or believing in an uh, apparition site that has been condemned by the church. Father Laurentin used always to say the following, our Lord Jesus Christ has only given us one criteria in the Gospels to discern the truth from a lie. And according to the New Testament, that criteria is to judge a tree by the fruit it bears. That's how I begin my book, from a quotation from Father Laurentin that says exactly that. So let's begin from the beginning, shall we? La Salette. And the apparition took place, if I'm not mistaken, on September the 19th, uh, 1846. So it's been now, we passed, or we are about to pass uh, in two days, uh, its anniversary. This message, I would say, is of the utmost gravity. The secret that it bears and which has finally been revealed and publicly published with the imprimatur of the Vatican through His Eminence Cardinal Ratzinger's permission, who at the time was the prefect of the doctrine of the faith in the Vatican before he became Pope Benedict XVI, shows a, a matter which is to this day very difficult to accept. But because we are uh, making a race somewhat with time, uh, we will try to simply uh, resume and explain in a few phrases the overall and the most important contents of these secrets. Through 1870, um, until the future events which have been foretold in the secret of La Salette, uh, mm -hmm. the children, um, Maxima Giraud, Melanie Calva, were told all the events that would take place from 1870 onward, beginning with the, with the rise and fall of the head of state of France of the time, who was uh, Napoleon, Emperor Napoleon III, nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. We all know what happened in France with the rise and fall of Napoleon III, who had the ambition of his uncle, but I'm afraid who didn't have his uh, tactical, tactician qualities or the moderation that the situation of the time called for. We know the Franco-Prussian War, which ran lost to the Prussian, to the Kaiser of the Prussian Empire. We know the fact that the Emperor of France was captured during the war. And um, after we lost the war, we lost as well two regions of France, the region of Alsace and Lorraine to the Germans. The Emperor of France humiliated decided to leave and go to London in exile, since he could not return with his face upward in France after the, the fiasco of the war he started. So from then, all this was predicted by the Blessed Virgin Mary to the two children. She talked about other wars that would take place. Uh, in some instances, it was very clear she referred to the first and second universal war, world war, world wars, plural and of a third world war as well that would take place. And I regret to say, since I was raised in Paris by the Jesuit, ironically enough, that in this particular prophecy, the Virgin mentioned that in this world conflict, Paris would be destroyed to the ground. And other cities as well, among which the city of Marseille, which is the second largest city of France. This war would see a great many victims, according to the secret of La Salette. This war would likewise uh, will see the demise of the country of France and other nations who would be allied to it, but would see as well the rise of a man of providence, a great monarch who would be sent by aspiration and decree and orders of heaven. This man would reestablish order, would liberate uh, those nations that have been conquered, invaded, and would restitute the church of yesteryears in its glory known by our fathers and theirs before them. 
But the prophecies do not stop there. The Virgin Mary in La Salette mentioned that the day would come when Rome would fall, when the faith will no longer be in the Vatican, and where the seat of Peter would be occupied by an Antichrist. Quote, unquote. Those words, those sentences, I regret to say, are not subject to any interpretation. Those are verbatim what Our Lady of La Salette revealed to these two young children who I do not think yet learned at the time how to lie. Nevertheless, those prophecies, those alarming prophecies, were brought forth to the church, local church, but there is more. An antichrist, a creature that would be probably, most likely be as close as possible as a human incarnation of the enemy of God, of the fallen angel, will be born as an illicit union between a Judaic nun and a bishop. This creature would have brothers and would be born with teeth, blaspheming and feeding out of impurities. This human being and his brothers would very quickly arise in the echelons of society and would be seen and considered as an answer to humanity's problems. All this, again, was revealed forth in the secret of La Salette. And I cannot stress this enough, although I sound like no, like an old scratch record that has a tendency of repeating itself approved by the local bishop, and after study and a meticulous investigation, and by the dicasterium of the doctrine of the faith in the Vatican. Those messages are as, as the sound of the utmost gravity. Furthermore, it does still not end there. In the apparitions and the secret of La Salette, the Virgin brought forth or pointed fingers of the clergy, not just merely the clergy of the time or of the place or the location, but the clergy of that that was yet to come and of a church, a false church that would rise from uh, the ashes of an ideology that was not seen in centuries in Europe. An ideology that embraces paganism, where the Roman Catholic and apostolic faith would cease to exist, at least temporarily. Temporarily, beg your pardon, my English sometimes is costly, but you think you'll get my point. From that moment, the church would have to undergo through the same passion that our Lord Jesus Christ went through himself during his life on earth, his passion. The church will have to go through its via crucis, will have to fall, will have to go to Golgotha, be crucified and buried. But the great promise of the Virgin Mary in La Salette, which was yet again echoed years late in Fatima, is this. At the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. This will be the resurrection of the Catholic Church, very much like that of our Lord on the third day. At the end, the immaculate heart of Mary, and through it, the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, will triumph. And the glory of yesteryears, the Church and our Lord will come out victorious yet again. The battle is already finished. The battle is already won. Nevertheless, we still have to go through our Golgotha crucifixion before the resurrection takes place. And that, I regret to say once again, is what these messages are bringing forth to the attention of the faithful. The messages of La Salette, very much like the others, call humanity at the end of these somewhat alarming prophecies to conversion, principally through the reading and the living of Holy Scriptures, the reading and the living of the Holy Gospels and Catechism, particularly I would recommend that of His Holiness Pope John Paul II, issued in 1992, Virgin Mary and Heaven through the Virgin Mary, causes to convert through leaving the holy sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, particularly 
holy confession, preferably every first Saturday of every month and weekly, if not daily, communion. But contrary to what we today, we hear from Rome, it is not enough to have a heart full of goodwill. It is not enough to say, I love God. I want to be close to him. I want to receive him through the holy sacrament of the altar. No. If you suspect for one moment that you've committed and a very grave offense, a very grave sin, a mortal sin, you cannot, you must not receive Holy Communion for you would transform it into a sacrilegious communion. If you think, and this is all in the book, in the teachings of St. Paul, it's nothing new. But heaven is asking us with faith to receive the Holy Eucharist worthily prepared. If you have committed a tremendous wrong or a sin that is that could be mortal, do not receive Holy Communion. Ask for confession first. Be what we call a state of grace and then receive the Holy Eucharist. Then you'll be receiving it properly the body and blood, the soul and the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And heaven insists again and again, one of the greatest weaknesses that the church has committed is not to put enough emphasis on the fact that whenever we receive the Holy Host, whenever we drink the wine of the Holy Chalice, we do not just receive a piece of bread or drink a bit of wine in commemoration of the Last Supper. No, that is a lie that the enemy of God wants man to believe. Truly, every time a priest consecrates the host of bread and the chalice of wine, it becomes immediately and unquestionably the body and the blood, the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you do this, if you do all this, and pray the Holy Rosary, and pray in communion with Magisterium, the true Magisterium of the Catholic Church, those will be the cornerstones of your salvation. That is one of the cornerstone of the message brought forth by heaven for heaven's first messenger, the mother of Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary. That is as well what she came to bring forth as a message in La, in La Salette, in Fatima, in La Fraudette, or Marie Julie Jani, and in the places I mentioned earlier. Therefore, was that all that the Virgin brought forth in her secrets in La Salette? Not quite. There is yet one more thing, quite extraordinary, that I will reveal to you as well today. The fact that, as I mentioned, uh, the Virgin mentioned that there would be many clergies that would fall victim to temptation, honors, popularity, comfort, wealth. And some will fall in into graver sins, depravity, um, impurity as we've seen in this past few years and as she said rome itself will fall victim to a status of where rome will fall on its knees and there will be no longer the proper faith and an antichrist will sit quote unquote in the seat of peter there was another message involving the coming of a future king descendant of the king and queen martyr of france for those of you who are listening and who are history fans and uh, adepts, you would know that in France, uh, the king and the queen martyrs, or those who are known as such, are referred to uh, his um, majesty, his most Catholic majesty, Louis XVI, and her highness, Marie Antoinette. Those are known in France as the king and queen martyr in France. According to the secret of La Salette, the descendant of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette will be called on fourth one day when France will be on its knees and out of breath in its dearest moment to come to rescue it, and not just France, but also the Catholic Church. According to Maximin Giraud, in a letter he wrote to the, uh, the Holy Father of the time, um, explained the following. The Virgin informed him that these events were to take place at the end of the 20th century. However, if humanity somehow responded 
favorably, those prophecies would not be cancelled, but postponed somewhat till the first quarter of the 21st century. This is now, and this is here. This is, in very short words, the overall resume of the contents of the secrets of La Salette. Again, formally approved by the Catholic Church. Tilly, Normandy, was an apparition site that very likely, very much like that of La Salette, confirmed the exact same sayings, including the coming of this great monarch who would be the descendant following the law, la loi salique, the salic law, from male to male, father to son, father to son, from Louis the sixteenth, the seventeenth, son of Louis the sixteenth and Marie Antoinette, who allegedly died in his cell of the jail of Le Temple during the revolution, to our time. Now, very briefly, I'll go as quickly as I can because we have a lot to cover. But uh, in one instance, the Maxime Giraud, the little boy who saw the Virgin Mary in La Salette, was as well instructed to go years later to see the um, descendant, or rather, the pretender, the rightful pretender to the French crown after Napoleon III, after losing the Franco-Prussian War, left for London in uh, exile. There was a new elections in France and the majority of the French deputies who were elected were all royalists, not Republicans. A committee of those uh, deputies went to see the Count, uh, the, uh, Count of um, Chambord, who was the nephew of Louis XVI, and who was living at the time in exile because of the Republic and the Empire of Napoleon III. He was living in exile in Austria in the castle of Falstaff. The deputy committee went and offered him the crown and the throne. He was delighted to accept, of course. The deputy of uh, the, the committee of French deputies went back to France to bring forth papers and uh, to fulfill some formalities that needed to be fulfilled and bring the papers for the good count, who was an extraordinary man, practicing, loving, and profoundly devoted to the church, for him to sign afterwards. However, uh, the lead... Uh, Maxime Giraud, who now was a man, was brought forth to the Count and asked to speak with him privately. During the meeting, the Count of Chambord was with his best friend, who happened to act as well as his secretary, who was the Count, the Count of Vincey. Now, the Count of Vincey wrote a letter to his family describing the events of this meeting. When uh, Maxime Giraud went to see the Count of Chambord, he revealed to him in private, and the Count of Vincey was watching from a distance uh, as the Count of Chambord and Maxime Giraud were speaking in private in a window which he could see. Uh, the Count of Vincey saw the Count of Chambord put his hand on his forehead and swallow tears. And then he could barely see, he barely hear him say, Oh, mon Dieu, oh my God, this cannot be. And the young Maxime Giraud continued to explain to him that secret that our lady. Uh, instructed him to reveal to the good Count of Chambord. Finally, the good Count of Chambord was about to give a roll of uh, gold coins to the young man for his trouble for having come from France to Austria, which uh, Maxima refused. He said, no, Our Lady asked me to do this as a mission. It would be wrong for me to benefit or profit out of it. So the only thing he, upon insistence, he accepted was simply the fair fees to return to France. Afterwards, the Count of Chambord confided into his best friend, the Count of Vincent told him, Henri, I have to tell you truly what was revealed to me, but it is a secret, which must be revealed only in God's good time. We cannot reveal it now, for it is not our Lord's will yet. But the secret is this. My cousin, Louis the Seventeenth, who, at the time of his demise, was ten years old, a little boy ten years old, in the cell of Le Temple, and who, they said, passed away, was in fact rescued and replaced by the corpse of a young teenager, as many of us suspected. Louis the Seventeenth, my good cousin, is well and alive and has a descendants. And one of his descendants will be called by heaven to come to the rescue of France and to restore the Catholic Church, which it appears will also fall. I cannot in all good conscience take the crown and the throne as it does not pertain for me to do so. But I cannot explain my reasons 
to the Committee of French Deputies as I'm not permitted to do so. So I have to come to, with a pretext, but we have to find consolation in knowing that the glory of yesteryears and of our fathers will come back to France and a great monarch will restore France in its proper place as the church's eldest daughter. This was reported by the Count of Orsay to his family through a letter which was later revealed historically speaking. When the Committee of French Deputies came back to Falstaff and offered a good count to send the document, the good count had already prepared a pretext not to accept it. And the pretext is this. His utmost condition was for the flag of France of his uh, ancestor Louis XIV to be restored and take back the place of the tri tricolor. The tricolor is the French flag which today represents France, blue, white, and red. He knew that the deputies would refuse out of their fear of starting a new revolution in France because of this concept. This was eradicate completely all the basis of the revolution which took place less than half a century before. He knew in advance the response and it didn't fail. Immediately, the deputies, terribly disappointed in the Comte de Chambord, returned to France and upon interviews with some of the most renowned magazines stated, the Count of Chambord has refused the crown of France for a handkerchief. That's history. But now you know a secret, the secret why the Count of Chambord refused. And all this is not a legend, it is history. And part of the secret of La Salette. Those are the great lines of the apparitions, the admonitions and prophecies of La Salette, which are, were only to be confirmed years later in the other apparitions we mentioned at the very beginning of the, the interview of this show. The next apparition as mentioned was Tilly, who confirmed, which confirmed all the events and messages of La Salette, then was La Frode. La Frode was uh, rather, was mostly featured through its great messenger, Marie-Julie Janie, a woman who had not a very developed education, but who had a tremendous faith in God, was miraculously healed of a cancer that was de devouring her at a very young age. The version appeared to her before the, the Blessed Sacrament or the Holy um, Tabernacle and told her she would be healed and asked her if she would accept to become a victim soul uh, for the conversion of sealers, sinners and also for the forgiveness uh, of the sins of France. Like many country women and men of France, Marie-Julie Janie was a patriot and loved France and the spirit which it represented. I mean, immediately gave her fiat and said yes. From that moment forth, Marie-Julie Janie began to suffer the greatest pains for the rest of her life, including leaving the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ miraculously through stigmatas every single Friday of her life, suffering through the more hard uh, of hardships. She had all the stigmatas, all of them without exception, in the hands, in the feet, in the flank, the crown, the back, the even on her chest where on one instant appeared the words inscribed O Crux Ave, which means Oh Hell, Holy Cross. No, She emitted a perfume of rose from her body. She levitated, she even had fights with the devil. No. And she offered it all to our Lord. The devil tried to tempt her. She fought heroically and never accepted. She adored the Catholic, uh, rather, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Trinity. She had a profound love of a daughter for her mother with the Blessed Virgin Mary. She had a profound respect and love for the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church and irrevocably and unconditionally submitted herself to the judgment of a local bishop and through him to the Catholic Church. She received Holy Communion miraculously out of nothingness before witnesses. All of this I write it in my book, including men of the cloth who were sept skeptic, saw the, ver the Eucharist appear miraculously on her mouth. Not unlike the famous miracle of Garabandal uh, a little over a century later. No, she, as I said, offered all her hardship 
for the conversion of sinners and for the church and France. But her prophecies were extraordinarily detailed. Extraordinarily detailed. All of the prophecies she brought forth from the her time of 1871 until 1941 uh, took place exactly as mentioned without any errors. To name but a few, the Franco-Prussian War, the First World War, the Second World War, the Algerian War. She predicted the place, the exact day, month, and year of the death of the Count of Chambord, we just spoke about, from La Salette. She described the date, the day, month, and year, and place of the passing away of the approved visionary uh, of La Salette, Melanie Calva. And it happened exactly as she predicted. She declared, she, on one instance, just before the invasion of France, uh, the Ver it was our Lord, I believe, who mentioned to marie julie Jeannie, giving her instructions for uh, the Marquis de la Franquerie, as I mentioned earlier, who wrote the, the cornerstone, very brief resume of the apparitions of La, of la Fraude. She asked marie julie Jeannie to tell the good Marquis to grab all the documentations, all the prophecies from La Fraude as the Germans were going to be invading France and to hide them away from German uh, in, um, occupiers. Now, that was before the invasion, before even the war was declared. The war, Second World War, was declared on September the 3rd, 1939, two days after the invasion of Poland by Germany, which took place on September the 1st, 1939. France and England declared two days later war on Germany, on Adolf Hitler. And it was only during the month of May of 1940 that, yes, indeed, the Germans invaded, invaded Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. France being, of all the countries of Europe, the one that, have, that has resisted the longest. No. England was saved because it was protected by the French Channel, not the English Channel, but the French Channel, and, of course, by the, no the, sea of, uh, the Northern Sea. So that was what saved England from a German invasion. But that being said, all of these events that took place were predicted to a precision which today is frightening. What is even more astonishing is, and really frightful, is the event she predicted after her passing away. Marie-Julie Janie announced that um, on the day of her death, which took place in 1941, March, early March 1941, um, on the moment of her death, the day will come after the Second World War, years and years later, when her body and that of her sister, who was also a remarkable Christian woman and a devotee and remarkable and loving helper, their bodies, both of them, would be one day exhumed. And upon the exhumation of their bodies, they both would be found incorrupt. And more than that, that of Marie-Julie Jeanne, would not only be found totally and completely intact, but with her heart still beating. Yes, you heard me correctly. With her heart still beating. Many people have said, and I am sure there will be others who will continue to do so, that's impossible, that's rubbish. That has never happened in the history of Christianity. Not true. The same thing happened to St. Joan of Arc when she was executed on the stake in the city of Rouen. The Englishman uh, boiled her body with uh, boiling oil and her entrails and heart were all that remained intact and the heart still beating. <laughs> when the English executioner, alarmed of seeing something he's never seen before, um, informed the English cardinal who was presiding the execution of the French saint. Uh, when he reported the event, the cardinal immediately said, prepare another pot of boiling oil and finish executing and throw it again on the remains of the witch. She must be eliminated completely and totally. So the Englishman executed the orders, threw again an entire pot of boiling oil on the remains, on the entrails, and beating hard of Joan of Arc, only to find it a minute later, still intact, and the heart of Joan of Arc still incorrupt and beating. This again is not a legend, but it was recorded on the process of rehabilitation 
from English witnesses. The enemy who gave testimony of this particular event are doing this rehabilitation process. The enemies of France would not, were not about to give, would not normally give an advantageous testimony for France against their own nation. That's what gives them a tremendous credibility. It appears that our Lord promised this same extraordinary grace to Marie-Julie Jeanne, whom what's more was told that her picture with that, with the effigy and drawing and image of King Louis XVI and of Marie Antoinette, martyr king and queen of France, would one day be placed on the altars of the Catholic Church during masses in commemoration of their sacrifices. So this is quite extraordinary. But what about the future? That quite, covers quite well the past. But what about the future, you will ask? The future has been foretold by Marie-Julie Jeanne in great, great detail. And it's not encouraging at all. But before we proceed forward, I cannot stress enough the following fact. The message of heaven through Marie-Julie Jeanne, through Lucia Luth Luth dos Santos from Fatima, from uh, Maxima Giraud, from Melanie Calva, from Sister Sasagawa and others, and the girls from Garabandal, not just a message of fright and doom and f disaster and apocalyptic events to come. No. The messages of heaven is twofold. It's a call from a loving and imploring mother to convert while there is still time through the means I just explained earlier, the Holy Scriptures, the sacraments of the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, particularly communion and confession before communion. But it is a message of hope, of hope. For indeed, the Virgin Mary and heaven, through her messengers, not only give us the means to save our souls, but also our bodies. And particularly through the messages of Marie-Julie Jeanne. In the prophecies of Marie-Julie Jeanne for future events, she foretells of a third world war that will be coming and well from Eastern Europe. And she gives incredibly enough through two messages that our Lord has given her um, a clue as to the time frame. It's incredible. The Virgin Mary or heaven through the Virgin Mary hardly ever, not to say never, gives a clue of a timeline. But in this instance, for Marie-Julie Jeanne, Heaven has given indeed a clue, and a remarkable one at that. Our Lord mentioned to Marie-Julie Jeanne that the beginning of these events that would unfold for our future will start from the year 80 to 83. I scratch my head, Debbie. I scratch my head for the longest time while I was writing this book. What on earth did Heaven men mean? The year 80 and 83? Was it 1880, 1883? No, impossible. Because at the time, none of these events took place and made no sense. Was it 1980, 1983? Rubbish. Doesn't fit. Could it be then 2080, 2083? No, because Maxime Giraud very clearly stated in La Salette that these prophecies would take, if humanity responds in kind, at the latest on the first quarter of the 21st century. That's now. So it had to be one, it meant only one thing. According to me, again, I'm not Father Laurentin, not by a long stretch of the imagination. I'm a very simple, ordinary Catholic Frenchman. And I scratched my head there before the longest time. What could it be? What on earth could it be? It had to be, or so I thought, it had to use a particular time in Marie-Julie Jeanne's life that was important enough to use it as a point of reference to add the year 1883 years later. What on earth? Could it possibly be also? I thought to myself, no. Finally, when I read the promise of our Lord of the exhumation of the body and the extraordinary, extraordinary miracle of the beating heart inside the body of Marie Julie I thought to myself, this will be the event that will force the Catholic Church and into recognizing the apparition case of Lafrodet as being worthy of belief. Could it possibly be that year? Marie-Julie Jeanne's death was in 1941. So in my mind, 
innocent. Then I began to add 80 plus 1941. Last. What could it be? If you add 1941 plus 80, you reach to the year 2021. If you add 83 years to 1941, we arrived to 2024. What happened in 2021? It was the apotheos, the zenith of um, COVID-19 when all the Catholic churches or the immense majority thereof closed their doors because of the fear of this virus. What happened in 2022? The unthinkable. Russia began something that we are not about to see the end of, the war in Ukraine. We has the potential today to initiate a war whose consequences we can't even begin to uh, fathom. What would happen in 2023 or what happened? The continuation, the escalation of this, th of this war in Ukraine that now brings us to the brink of an international world conflict. We are two hands away as of right now. Right now, Sebastopol has been bombed and two vessels have been bombed with British-made missiles. What will happen in 2024? I have my ideas. But again, um, I am not an authority, and my words mean nothing at all. But that was my conclusion. I wrote about that in my, in my book. Mm -hmm. The year 1883, this event will start to unfold. And I do believe that this war in Ukraine and this war that has started not for the reasons we all believe through the bomb, uh, mass bombard and bombarding of uh, the media's expl dictated explanations, we'll see the world in a case of chaos. For as of right now, I do not know of any diplomatic party that is trying to find a peaceful solution. No one, not France, mm -hmm. a country which I regret to say is making me ashamed to be a Frenchman today. Not England, not the European Union, not the United Nations, certainly not the United States. Yeah. We are going towards a precipice whose consequences we are about to experience mm -hmm. in a very short while. So Marie-Julie Janine's message in my book takes tremendous importance and has for the ambition to be the most important uh, revelations of the apparitions and messages of heaven through Marie Julijani in the English speaking world. The book is being translated, is, is already translated in Spanish, it's about to start into Spanish, <coughs> excuse me, to be propagated in the Spanish speaking world. And I'm doing, as we speak, the French translation of the entire book. My main concern in writing this book is, was only one. I married, well, an American girl who gave me the most precious children I possibly could have had. I had a family in France. I could not have dreamt of having better. And for me, the book, the, right, the issuings, uh, the writing of this book was a way for me to say merci to heaven. For the parents I had, for my mother in particular, for my two children, for a brother that is second to none, my best friend, and for children that are my, uh, my life. I, ha I could not imagine a better way to say merci to heaven. And my wife was the one who inspired me in writing this book to express such thanks. So now the time has become when the situation is really dear and alarming, to say the least. After Marie-Julie uh, initial prediction, she announced the following. She mentioned that the Catholic Church, from this Catholic Church, um, they will be, they will rise a false church from the Roman Catholic Church that we knew before its arrival. That the Antichrist will be walking amongst cardinals and bishops in the parlors of the Vatican. She mentioned that indeed a false doctrine will come forth, and a new um, liturgy will be will be brought forth, which will be nothing lo less than an abomination in the eyes of God. She mentioned that there will be schism in different apostolic colleges. We see one right now today in Germany, mm -hmm. which uh, has the pretension of making a parallel magisterium to that of Rome. 
and the Catholic Church has not created or threatened excommunication for those. Oh no, not not a declaration that they are heretics. No, of course not. But for those who are guilty of the unforgivable crime of loving God with the traditional ways, the way our fathers, and again, theirs before them, used for two millennia, ah, those are heretics, intransigent, inflexible, supposed Christians. No, those would be threatened of heresy by Rome. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. These it events, yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. And this has been foretold by Marie-Julie Janie in La Fraude, by the children of La, La Salette. That's why the bishop of uh, Grenoble has hidden purposely this secret, which was inconvenient to the church, and threw it and sent it to the Vatican to be lost under the carpet of convenient, under the dusty carpet of convenient forgetfulness in the depths of the Vatican's libraries, only to have been found by sheer divine providence in 1999. Mm. This is nothing short of a scandal. And another reason why I wrote this book, to redeem the unforgivable crime, this crime by my countrymen, who happened to be the Archbishop of Grenoble, and many of his collaborators. It is a disgrace. It is betrayal. So, La Fraude merely echoes the messages of La, of La Salette, but in greater detail. She mentions as well that there will be a third world war that will come from the East, with an alliance that will come forth from the Eastern Europeans, particularly the Russians, and an alliance with Muslim, with a consortium of Muslim nations. She mentioned before this war, there would be revolutions, particularly in all of Europe, but particularly in France and in Italy. Revolutions that will principally take place through a uh, cohort of foreign Muslims uh, that would have come out of expatriation or immigration. Through an uncontrolled immigration where France, among other nations of Europe, will totally raise the barriers of their borders to receive them uh, in an overwhelming manner. Now, please uh, do understand that when these messages were given in 1870, Five seventy-eight, eighteen eighties. It was considered sheer rubbish and completely unrealistic. Northern Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, were colonies of France. They were in the conquered territories, French territories, and the majority of these populations did not amount to more than twenty, perhaps thirty million people at the very most, stretching the imagination. So it was considered unrealistic, and it was at the time. Today, this prophecy has already taken place. Let me give an example. I'm a Frenchman. I was born there. There is, or rather, it is not an accident. I live on this side of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. Now, I was born in Paris to, that was to, still French. Today, when I go back to Paris and I go back to France quite often, I do not recognize the country I grew up with. I grew up in, not at all. Today, in a country where we have 68 million inhabitants, about 17 to 17 and a half million of those 68 million people are descendants of immigrants from Northern Africa and, Afri and Central Africa, Muslims. We're talking about the country of King Saint Louis the church elder's daughter. We have right now more Muslims that are practicing their faith in France than Roman Catholic, that practicing Roman Catholics. I hope that your auditors are understanding what I'm ex explaining. This is testimony of a Frenchman who comes from France. There is no more French than I am. I am France in all its concept. I adore my country, I love my nation. My every generation of my country, of my family, has answered the call to join the colors and take arms against foreign invaders. Every single generation. No? So now we are told that the Third World War will take place after a revolution takes place in France, in Italy, and other nations in France. And these Russians invaders, all this will take place between 80 and 80. Well, we start the beginning of all these events between 80 and 83. I give you my theory. Russia will invade through a blitzkrieg of sorts immediately all the nations from the Bielorussian 
borders all the way to the Rhine River. It will be very quick and it will wipe away very quickly all the NATO defenses that stand in that way. Today, is this realistic? Quite so. France and England are unquestionably the strongest military powers in continental Europe. They both have given to Ukraine this past year millions and millions of tons of ammunition to Ukraine, which Ukraine has consumed like if there were no tomorrow. France and England, Germany, all the members of the European Union have no more reserves. Yesterday or the day before yesterday, I don't remember very well, but a few days ago, I watch all the time French TV. I keep in touch with my home nation. And there was a general, a French general, in uh, retired, who explained that he still have a great many friends in active duty in France. And he was explaining that if today France, England, Germany, were to fight a conventional war, the same way the Ukrainians are today against the Russians, France would not be able to last more than 11 days with the reserve of ammunition it holds in its arsenal. England, nine. Germany, six. That's the testimony of a French superior officer. Because the immense majority of our reserves were given for the past uh, 14 months to Ukraine, which has dilapidated in a very amateurish manner all the ammunition and weapons that it has received. Ukraine has received hundreds of billions of euros of equipment and ammunition, not mostly from the Europe, the Europeans. Altogether, the Europeans did not match the Americans. The Americans were the principal uh, providers of weapons. Billions from your pocket, Debbie, from all the pockets of your American countrymen. Yes. That is your money. That is my money as well from France and here that has gone into that. And today, Europe and the United States are in no way ready no. to face a conventional war. They say, well, look at Russia. They're not managing to make any progress in Ukraine. Please watch uh, Judging Freedom with Judge Napolitano, an American commentator uh, yeah. on the internet. Watch him who invites people of the likes of uh, Colonel McGregor, a hero of the uh, Persian war. He, they will tell you what's the situation, why the Russians are not attacking yet. Putin, according to those guys and some officers that were superior officers in the CIA, are explaining that Putin wants to give a leeway for negotiations. If he could, he could send right now his 700,000 troops that are on the border with Ukraine, plus those that are in Ukraine, and start a massive invasion and start using their EM EMP electromagnetic pulses cannons from uh, the ground and from satellites to eliminate once and for all, all the defenses of, of what remains of the uh, Ukrainian defenses. They're not doing it according to them, according to the American officers, because as to give a leeway for negotiation and peace. It doesn't appear that anyone wants to, to sue for peace right now in Ukraine. It's another story and it's politics, which I don't want to enter into it. So we go back to again to the prophecies of Marie Julie Janine. According to her, the time will come when Russia will form an alliance with um, a consortium of Muslim nations and invade and we sweep away all the defenses of NATO from Poland all the way to the Rhine River. Well, they will make a quick pause now. At that moment, uh, the Muslims will start disembarking in South Italy, in South of France, not yet in South of France, but the Russians will throw the dice and will make a bet that the French nuclear arsenals will not be uh, used upon the invasion of France. Now, you have to understand the politics of the Europeans. And the General de Gaulle, the nuclear arsenal of France, which is superior to that of England, we are the largest nuclear force in continental Europe, even above in that of England. Now, but de Gaulle, when he installed the nuclear arsenal in France, was with the following concept. If anyone, any nation, sets foot on French soil, will use the nuclear dissuasion weapons to punish them accordingly. And we have enough. We have a, a nuclear arsenal of over 380 nuclear warheads. That's enough to wipe out half of the globe. No, nothing to be proud of. General de Gaulle used to say that what makes a nation great is not the amount of corpse, corpses it can produce, but also the amount of corpses it can avoid. And he was right. So according to Marie-Julie the Russians finally will throw the dice, betting that the, France, the
the French will not respond with a nuclear response. And according to Marie Julie there would be right, they will be right. There will be three major attacks that will take over France. One, the principal attack will not be Paris. It will be the city of Orleans, Orléans. The second largest attack will be Paris, which will resist the area of Paris for 45 days, only to collapse after for lack of ammunition. And the third attack will go through Switzerland and central France, which will meet with the disembarking force of Muslims in southern France, and uh, the Muslims will disembark in South Italy, southern France, the La Costa del Sol in España, in Spain, and Andalusia, in the southern part of Spain. All this invasion from the south with the Muslim would meet with the Russians in central France. The, Ita the Muslims in South Italy will race against the Russians to reach Rome first. The Russians will win. They will take over Rome and plant the flag on the Dome of St. Peter. But in the meantime, the Muslims will uh, not encounter too much uh, resistance in Andalusia and Costa del Sol in Spain. The King of Spain will leave temporarily, Spain only to return and push the Muslims back after a certain amount of, of war. But remarkably, there is another prediction which is also very concerning that Marie Lijoni received from Our Lady. No, from St. Michael the Archangel, if memory serves. The prophecy was this. France, during the war, will not receive any help from her lands. That means the Americans. Now, this is very troubling, not mm -hmm. because France will not receive help, but because it would mean, since the French and the Americans are brothers of arms and have been since uh, Le Marquis de Lafayette and George Washington and, Roche and um, Rochambeau at the Battle of Yorktown, we've always been brothers of if arms under every conflict. We would have never had a country. If oh, it no, and we would not have had, we would have not had France liberated either. We are brothers. Yes. And we have had ups and downs, but we are brothers. The fact of the matter, Marie-Julie Jeanne said that will, France will receive no help from her allies because France has not had a king for many years. But the real reason that leads me, that makes me very alarmed is this. I love the United States, as I said. I married an American lady. My children are half American, half French. But for the Americans not to come to the rescue of their brothers, of their friends across the Atlantic, it's not a bad will. I believe it will be because they won't be able to. Either or two possible reasons. It could be either that America will be hit, will be hit so hard that it will need all its resources to get back on its feet. And or it could be because all of its attention be placed elsewhere through a most um, serious front. Could it possibly be that of China and Asia? I'm forced to wonder. But the message was very clear. France and her allies in Europe will not receive any help from its allies. However, uh, heaven will send a man of destiny, of providence, to save France and the Catholic Church. This man, Marie-Julie Jeanne said, will be the descendant of the, again, the martyr king and the martyr queen of France, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. She said it exactly as I'm telling you. This man will be sought by a man who will receive uh, privileged um, apparitions of heaven and who will be informed to leave France and reach uh, and seek the Dauphin, the Prince of France, for him to come to France and liberate France and reinstall the Catholic Church. That man from France uh, will be told where the King of France is today. The King of France has a name. His name is Henri V de la Croix, Henry V of the Cross. And this man, uh, when the battlefront in France, who will not, which will not be totally conquered, uh, once the front will be stabilized between, I think, Cherbourg and Bordeaux, uh, the King of France, Henry V of the Cross, will come and will take the control, although he will meet a great deal of resistance in France, even from royalist parties who will be counted by the fingers of a hand, or so it's said, the version said. But he will take control uh, of the army, the superior officers of which will see in him 
in the divine providence and will push back the invaders, both Muslims and Russians, Eastern Europeans. Now, <laughs> I know you work with Ron and uh, with Monique Turnbull, who work in Madden Refuge. I've become very good friends with them both. And uh, Monique Turnbull asked me on uh, one of your shows uh, the following question. Xavier, she said, um, if indeed uh, you knew that the King of France would hear you today in this show, what do you think you would like to tell him? And I, would, uh, and I answered Monique uh, in the following manner. I said, Monique, I'm very grateful you asked me that question because I would aspire to be the first Frenchman to publicly offer my allegiance to the King of France and to repeat uh, the motto of my ancestors, which was my soul to God, my life to the King, my heart to the Virgin Mary, my honor to myself. I didn't know if the King of France, <laughs> the Dauphin, wherever he is, will ever hear this message. But if he does, I take great pride uh, to be the first Frenchman to, to say present to the call that the king would make, hopefully, one day soon. So this king would come, according to the Virgin Mary, and would indeed be helped uh, miraculously through the forces of heaven. No? But before, while the, the war will take place, this will be part, according to Marie Julie Jeanne, as the chastisement, man-made, to a humanity that deserves it because of the sins it has committed for decades, if not centuries. But there will be another chastisement that will fall upon humanity that will be sent from heaven. And that will be, during this moment of wars, a chastisement translated through uh, another pandemium, pandemium of a disease, a virus, that would be considerably graver yes. than COVID-19. Considerably. This virus, the Marie-Julie Janine used to call it the burning plague. And she was told by the Virgin Mary that the medical science of humanity mm -hmm. will remain mute and unable to come with an answer to counteract it. This disease will be airborne, immensely contagious, and will have absolutely no remedy at all, and will cause millions of victims throughout the planet. Despite of human science being incapable to come with an answer to that disaster, heaven will send one, one, which will save humanity to those who will take it. This uh, remedy is in my book, and I will tell you all what it is right now. It is, and forgive my English and my horrible French pronunciation, so bear with me. It will be the hawthorn leaf. Hawthorn? Yes. H A W T H O R N. Hawthorn. Perfectly. Hawthorn. Yes. Hawthorn. <laughs> so that particular remedy will be the only answer to cure against this malady, this illness uh, that will be ever so devastating. And there is a way the Virgin Mary is given for us to apply it and consume it to, to heal those who will fall victim to this disease. And the remedy is this. It's all in my book, but I will tell you nevertheless, the important thing is for the information to be spread around. No? That's all that matters. And the way to be healed is this. The Virgin explained that once you take those leaves, you have to take off all the wooden uh, tige, no? Mm -hmm. And first of all, you have to make an infusion by having some a pot of boiling water first boil. So we're supposed to make an infusion of this hawthorn, hawthorn leaf, no? So you have this boiling pot of water. You put, you put the hawthorn leaves in the boiling water. The quantity was not mentioned. You put a, a cup on top of the boiling water pot and you wait for 14 minutes, one four, not 13, not 15 minutes, but 14 minutes. Why do not ask me? I have no idea. Well, I have an idea through another mystic, but I will explain that in a moment. 
After 14 minutes, I stopped, I arrived, immediately turned the fire off, take off the cap of the pot, and immediately put the, this infusion in a container. So you could possibly make it go through a filter uh, for tea or um, even coffee, fill, anything, but just to, uh, to, re to take away the impurities. And then you're supposed to consume it three times a day. Three times a day, three times a day. And to do it this as early as possible before the symptoms begin to develop. If you take it too late, the Blessed Virgin Mary stated, then you will not be able to stop the death that will ensue, but you will be able to alleviate the torment and the suffering. So once you have these events, you suspect you have it, you have to take it, the, this infusion immediately, every day, three times a day, every day, in the fashion that I've just described to you. So that said, would be... Someone is asking, yes. David, there are different types of hawthorn, uh, hawthorn leaves. Um, does Any. it matter? doesn't matter. No. Okay. No. Great. Now, uh, there is another mystic I work with who receives, who has been receiving a message of our Lord and heaven since the age of three. He's a man of the cloth, a man who has been known to have uh, exercised many people. He has started his own um, uh, Catholic order. Now, uh, of Saint Joseph Benoit Labre in Quebec. His name is uh, Reverend Father Michel Rodrigue. Now, there's been controversy which has been resolved. Uh, the local bishop has not condemned him at all. His, his local bishop has not simply approved him yet, but neither condemned. He waits for the events to, to develop. But uh, Father Michel Labre was told also of the Hawthorne leaf as well, and God the Father has supposedly told him that the reason for the 14 minutes that this was requested by his, the mother of God was because it would take that amount of time for all the positive properties of the Hawthorne leaf to dissolve in the water. It will not be as effective if it lasts even one minute later or if it's taken away one minute earlier. It has to be 14. That was the explanation that God the Father gave Reverend Father Michel Rodrigue. No? So that is an explanation. And to go back to Marie-Julie Janine, that is one of the remedy that uh, Our Lady in Heaven through the Virgin Mary has given humanity. Other remedies or other protections for physical protections, in addition to the spiritual one, which we just discussed before. Remember the Gospels, Holy Scriptures, the Sacrament of the Catholic Church, Confession, and the Holy Eucharist, and prayer of the Holy Rosary, and also fasting. Those are the salvation and the instruments for spiritual salvation. The physical salvation, one of them is the Hawthorne. Another one that the Virgin Mary has asked through Marie-Julie Janie is also the wearing of the purple scapula, which can be blessed according to the Virgin Mary by inner priest. This, the Catholic Church has absolutely no objection to it at all, and it's a scapula, scapula that may, no priest uh, can refuse to bless. Also, the Virgin asked through Marie-Julie Janie the importance of wearing the miraculous medal to have everything blessed by your priest. She asked as well to wear the crucifix and the cross of pardon, which is a cross which is described even with a photo in my book. There are also the medal of Our Lady of Good God to protect as well our children and to have our children wear them, which is a protection uh, for our children against impurity and the impurity factors that they are bombarded with every day in school. Uh, she has as well the brown scapula, including the sc scapula medal. Today, it's really exhausting. Many Catholic priests, I would say a great majority of them, when they do their sermon on Sundays, cover generalities. But very few, ever so few, discuss of the treasures of Catholic sacramentals approved and recognized by the Church, among which the brown scapula. How many of your viewers, Debbie, do you think know that in 1215, when the Virgin appeared to St. Simon Stock, an English monk, yes, for those of you who wonder, yes, the English have some sense too, they're not all French. <laughs> I'm sorry, I always love uh, shooting them in English. 
It's just a joke, of course. But the English had some sense too, out of sheer mercy of heaven. So St. Simon's stock was one of them. <laughs> but when the Virgin appeared with the child Jesus and the scapular of Mont Carmel to him, she gave a remarkable treasure to the faithful, to the church, for the church is you, me, those who are watching us right now. And the message, the treasure was this, all those, no matter what sins they've committed, who will wear upon their persons a blessed scapula or medal of the scapula itself, will never, ever suffer the fires of hell, no matter what they've committed, sin-wise. You could have committed the worst possible sin, you will go to purgatory, possibly, and suffer the fires of purgatory. But all the souls that go to purgatory are blessed souls. For one day, they will go to heaven. Purgatory, you must clearly understand, is a place where people go only for a period of time, never for eternity. It's like a shower where you wash your being of all the impurities and sins you've committed throughout your life. So, all those who wear the scapula, blessed by your priest, at the moment of death, will never suffer the fires of hell, no matter Thank what... Thank since you you've committed for bringing up the scapular yes everyone no, no. i, I just I, want to say everyone wear the brown scapular go to your priest be enrolled in the brown scapular you don't have to have them blessed every time you get a new one one wears out when you you lost it whatever happened you left it you know some I, it doesn't matter just wear one because this is one of the promises that's been given us by Our Lady that will protect us. And the, all these things that, that you're talking about, Xavier, they're going to happen so fast. And this is one of the reasons, I think, why they're, right now they're being repeated and repeated and repeated. Because this is going to happen so fast that we're going to be uh, sort of knocked off our rails for a moment. And we have to get our wits about us and remember what it is we have to do. The first Saturdays, um, you know, we, we can complain and be concerned about everything that's happening, but really what are we doing to help mitigate any of this, not only for the world, but for our own souls? The first Saturdays, the scapular, the rosary, um, all of these things, the, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, all these things that we have at our disposal um, to use help mitigate what's going on and also we ha I had another question from someone in, in another interview apparently you had talked about um maybe uh belgium being um invaded is that something that that um uh you, do you think that may be one of the ways that uh they come into france is through belgium belgium yes all of western europe will be invaded through this russian blitzkrieg belgium will be no exception the the Russians will come also through Belgium in northern northern France, in Picardy, in part of Normandy. But the, there will be three major attacks that the Russians will use to invade France. The principal, the strongest attack will take place and will aim at Orleans, Orléans. And then there will be a battle in Nantes with the remnants of the French army who finally will beat the Russians. Yes. The Russians will retreat in Nantes, in the city of Nantes. But Orléans will be the strongest armed force that Russians will lead to reach the Atlantic Ocean. They will fail. The second largest attack will be Paris. And the French army will surround Paris and will resist for 45 days. Not 44, not 46, 45. And they will lose, finally, the war, the battle, rather, uh, for lack of ammunition and for the exhaustive uh, amount of casualties we will have taken. The third largest attack will go through Switzerland and will reach central France. They will go, they will try also to reach the Atlantic through Bordeaux, which will be decimated. And the Muslims will join them to join forces against the French, but they will lose miserably as well. And the Muslim will reach, they will be collaborators in France. French Muslims will collaborate with the invading Muslims from the south of France and with the Russians because a great, an immense part of the French Muslim population profoundly hates the French people for two reasons. Because France is indeed known as the as the church eldest daughter 
And second of all, because they will never have forgiven the French for the humiliation of the colonies. Mm. Mm. So I hope that answers your question. Now, yes. in regards to the prophecy, the French king will come. All these diseases will come through. There will be millions of victims on both sides of the camp. On, on The entire world population will be affected. But there will be those faithful who will have heard, who will be prepared, and some of them will be already prepared in refuges. The version said to Marie Julie Jani, one, no, she said, quote unquote, the safest area in the universe uh, that will be protected by heaven will be the region or the southern and central region of Brittany in France. Although there will be future communities slash refuges throughout the entire world and many in Northern America, many in the United States, Mexico, Canada. There will be many in Canada. I mentioned Father Michel Rodrigue who has finished building, almost finished building. He's in Quebec, but there are a multitude of others and it's very easy to find out where. But nevertheless, that's another subject for another show, if you like. Yes. But to go back to the subject of Marie Lijani, the French king will come. We'll push with... Um, military force that will be inferior in numbers and firepower than its Russian counterpart. And through the help and the assistance of angels and of miraculous forces from heaven, the Russians will be pushed back out of France, although they will, on their way out of France, before the, leaving uh, their tail between their legs, they will bomb Paris at night through two different regions, two different cities, while they withdraw. One will be from the city of Orléans, the other from the city of Blois. Two nuclear weapons that will fall on Paris at night and will pulverize the French capital to such an extent that the entire sup super, um, volume, uh, air, su surface area will collapse in a bottomless crater, except for a very small part among which uh, the island, uh, uh, l'île de la Cité, where, which host the Cathedral of Notre Dame. All the rest of Paris will collapse in a bottomless crater. So hard and devastating will the bombing of Paris be. Marseille, again, confirmation of the prophecies of La Salette. Marie-Julie Jeanne was told that Marseille will sink in the Mediterranean Sea. Marseille, for those of you who are not familiar with the city, is the second largest city in France. And the more than half of the French city is occupied by a population of Muslim people. And there is it's the largest city of crime, mostly held by French Muslims and tremendous drug traffic, trafficking there, uh, gangs armed with uh, um, um, uh, machine guns of all sorts. The French police is um, overpowered there. According to Marie Julie Marseille will be wiped out completely, totally, and will sink in the Mediterranean Sea. Paris, when it will be destroyed, the Virgin said with tears in her in her eyes and with a trembling voice, according to Marie-Julie Jani, we'll only have very few survivors. She said, I tremble at the idea of telling you how many. And she said, 100 minus 12. 88 survivors in an area which has about 9 million French citizens. 88 will survive only. Marie-Julie Jani said that the French king will be finally crowned uh, by uh, a, a very young bishop in Paris, but also in the Cathedral of Reims, like all the French kings since the first French king, Clovis. And uh, the cathedrals will stand, although they will be very poorly decorated because of the war, damaged somewhat, but standing. And the French king will be crowned there. In the meantime, the king of Spain, the cousin of the French king, will manage to push back to the sea all the Muslim invaders. And with a much smaller force, will join the French king to liberate northern Italy. At that time, already, all of France will be freed, part of Belgium, part of Germany, Switzerland, and northern Italy. And there will be a war in Italy that will last about three years, until finally Rome will be liberated, or what remains of Rome, and the French king, principally followed by his cousin, the king of Spain, will reinstitute on the throne of Peter a quote-unquote an angelic pope who will restore the Catholic Church 
to the traditional glory of yesteryears. Mm -hmm. That will be the time when the final seal, the last chastisement, if you will, will take place. And that will be the three days of darkness. Yes, Marie Jeanne, like Padre Pio, like Saint Padre Pio, confirmed indeed that, or said before Padre Pio, that there will be three days of darkness. And then she explains exactly what we have to do. We have to cover all the windows. There will be warnings before that for people to be able to prepare. The visionaries of Garabandal and other places will warn everyone to be prepared in advance. You will have to shut down your windows, you'll lock your doors. And and the version said to Marie Julie that everyone is supposed to get a 100% beeswax candle that is to be lit are during the three days of darkness. That particular candle will not be consumed during those three days of darkness, will remain intact for three days, and I believe two nights. It could be a small thing like this. It will be lit during the entire period and will not be consumed. Or it could be something bigger, the same. But it must be 100% beeswax. All the explanations are in my book. If you want to have another show talking about the preparations of the three days of, of darkness, we can. Yep. I've done this with my friend, yes. with my good friend John Henry Weston. I've done this with uh, my friend Taylor, Taylor Marshall, that is. We mm -hmm. lose Roman, who is... Uh, we had over half a million viewers on that particular show. I'd be delighted to do that with you, with uh, also with uh, Ron and with uh, Monique. You tell me uh, when I'll be at your disposal. Thank but you. those are the messages, principally, of Marie Julie extraordinary apparition side. And this book has the ambition to bring forth to the American people and to the English speaking people around the world these messages with utmost precision. This was the first one, I think, that was published in the United States, that is published in the United States and unquestionably the most detailed. Um, Finally, there, after Marie Julie Janie, there was Fatima. Uh, I, do we still have time, Debbie? I don't want to abuse of your time. No, no, no. we have time. Go right ahead. Splendid. We have now uh, the apparitions, of course, of Fatima. Fatima, or rather, Marie Julie Janie took place before Fatima, during the apparitions of Fatima, and well after the apparitions of Fatima. But there was Fatima that took place in the meantime. And there, we know of the, the three secrets of Fatima. We know the first one, which principally involved the passing away of Jacinta and Francisco of the Spanish flu, which took place exactly as the version announced. The second secret of Fatima being, being the coming. That was at the conditional tense. The coming of the Second World War and the spreading of Russia's errors if humanity does not convert and return to a son in time. In other words, this was conditional to the fact that if man converted in time, who knows, Adolf Hitler would have been stopped in 1936 if the, maybe the French would have gone in, stopped him when he he, he um, claimed Austria and Czechoslovakia uh, for the Third Reich before the invasion of Poland, it would have been the end. And maybe Russia, the coup of, uh, of the November, October, November 1917 would have failed and communism would never have taken place uh, the uh, Russian Tsar would have remained in, and Russia would still be known as a, Catholic, or as a, a Christian Orthodox Church. And communism would not have spread her as for the world. But no, the Church decided, very much like in Grenoble with La Salette, to keep the secret quiet. Yes, the second was revealed, but the third, no. And the instructions of the Virgin Mary were extremely explicit not subject to any interpretation. The message of heaven, not the message of the Virgin Mary, the message of heaven echoed by the Virgin Mary were this. The third secret of Fatima was to be revealed publicly to the faithful either at the moment of death or after the, the death of Lucia dos Santos or no later than 1960. In 1960, the pontiff was John the Twenty-Third, who indeed, as required, opened not one envelope but the two envelopes that Lucia dos Santos wrote upon the instructions of the Archbishop of Fatima. The first envelope involved a vision, which we all been told about on June 
the year of the year 2000 by His Eminence Cardinal Bertone as a second envelope consisted and still consists today of the accompanying message of the Virgin May, which to this day, I tell you formally, has not been formally or publicly revealed by the Vatican, despite what Cardinal Bertone said, that upon the revelations of the vision of Lucia dos Santos, there was nothing more to be brought for, there was nothing more to the third secret of Fatima. I tell you solemnly, although I find no pleasure in saying this, on the contrary, utmost pain and sadness, but Cardinal Bertone lied. For indeed, there was the additional accompanying message that was never revealed, except by His Eminence Cardinal Ottaviani through a German ma magazine called Neus Europa, no? and later as well through, remarkably enough, <laughs> the apparitions of Fatima, the, of Akita in Japan. And I will tell you very quickly, uh, if I have the time, the circumstances of the revelation of the first secret of Fatima in Akita in Japan, if I have time. I proceed forward. So, Fatima, we all know of the miracle of the sun, and the apparition of Fatima was not approved right away, despite of the extraordinary uh, miracle of the sun, no. It was approved only in 1930, 13 years later of assiduous, methodical, careful, and at the very beginning, I would even go as far as to say, hostile investigation of the Catholic Church. And I asked Father Laurentin, why is the Catholic Church always investigating this on a hostile basis? And I was young. I was at the time when I met him first, I was 20, 25, 26 years old. I was a very young man, <laughs> thinking to know everything and being very foolish. <laughs> like most men of that age. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned quickly, Father Laurentin ever so kindly put me back in my place with a great deal of charity and fatherly warmth. And he told me, Xavier, you must understand, the Catholic Church cannot offer itself the luxury ever to one day approve an apparition site that would prove later to be a falsehood, a falsehood possibly even construed by the enemy of God. So it is our duty as the appointed church built upon St. Peter by our Lord Jesus Christ to take every precaution and to attack and try to torpedo every alleged apparition site of the Blessed Mother. For indeed, if an apparition site truly comes from God, there is nothing any man on the surface of this earth can do to stop the designs of God. However, if there is a false apparition site that is construed and founded upon the lies of the enemy of God from down below. The church has the authority to unveil this falsehood. And indeed, the Catholic Church, the past uh, half century, has condemned multitude of apparition sites. Peña Blanca in Chile, to name but one. Uh, Bayside, I believe, in New York, condemned by the Catholic Church upon finding incongruencies and contradictions with the deposit of the faith. Recently, I think Nashu in South Korea was condemned by the local bishop. No, so the church does not hesitate for one moment to to hit with a sword. No, but in some instances she has approved, and others, being very surprised, still pending. And I'm referring like Garabandal in in Spain, and others as well. So condemnation does come after assiduous investigation, but so does approval. So Fatima was proven worthy was proven worthy being worthy of belief. And indeed, all the prophecies which were apocalyptic took place. Second World War took place exactly and at the at the beginning of the reign of Pius XI, exactly as the version said, the R Russian uh, USSR spread his errors throughout every continent of the of the world it happened exactly as, as promised and the third secret of fatima uh, some of the events as you were about to find out took place others are yet to take place but pope, pope john the 23rd when he unsealed the second envelope and read the message according to the testimonies who were there including cardinal taviani 
became white, like an aspirin, French expression translated into English. And immediately folded the piece of paper back, put it back in the unsealed envelope and gave it to his aide, stating, quote, unquote, this message is not meant for our time. Blimey, really? You mean to say, Your Holiness, that God and heaven made a mistake by appointing the, the mother of Christ to give these instructions? They were not, heaven was not able to foretold the future when it gave these instructions for the Blessed Virgin Mary. They were not to, able to foretell the geopolitical situation of 1960 and therefore made a mistake for you to correct by saying this does not is not meant for the for our time. Truly, it's extraordinary. It takes an immense amount of gall to find yourself wiser than heaven and disobey purposely the instructions of God from an apparition side which has been formally approved by the Archbishop of Fatima and later by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in Rome. Extraordinary. But he was not the only one at fault. His successors fell in the same trap. Paul VI did exactly the same thing. John Paul I, God help him. He only reigned for 33 days. So he had perhaps an excuse. And he passed away under, after his short reign, shall we say, under more suspicious circumstances. John Paul II, at least, had the excuse of having attempted again and again to echo and bring forth to the public, to the faithful, the message which was meant for them to be aware of, to hear. But he was only able at the end, although on one particular interview, he practically revealed it all when he said, and it is in my book, I don't have my book under my eyes right now, but when the Pope said very clearly, if you hear that men are to die in matters of second from one moment to the other, and uh, uh, it's just time to come to heaven, if you hear that a war is to take place and destroy and wipe out the larger part of uh, world's humanity, if you hear this or if you hear that, uh, always have recourse to the Holy Rosary, of the Holy Rosary, to the sacraments, and do not be afraid, do not be afraid, as the Pope used to say. That was an echo. And then, before the end of his reign, he ordered at least the revelation of the first half of the third secret, which was the vision which we are all familiar with, and echoed in my book. I even put a picture describing the vision as the children saw it. But the message, the third secret of Fatima, was indeed revealed indirectly by Cardinal Ottaviani. Now, uh, as I mentioned, it's all re written uh, word for word, the way it was um, revealed by His Eminence, the Cardinal, in my book. But remarkably enough, and this is an extraordinary confirmation, Akita, as I mentioned before, the apparitions of Akita that began in the 19, early 1970s, I believe 1973, memory serves, to a sister who was uh, mu uh, deaf, could not hear, was miraculously cured only to fall back to deafness, only to be healed yet again. And she had a stigmata, as did a wooden representation, a wooden statue of Our Lady, Queen of All Nations, uh, and a, a Dutch, a Holland, a, a Dutch uh, advocation, which was recently approved by the Catholic Church. And um, the statue, not only Sister Sasagawa had the stigmata of Our Lord, but also the statue had the same stigmata on her wooden hands, was uh, known to have wept 101 times human tears, to have sweated human sweat, investigated upon instructions of His uh, Excellency Bishop Ito, the local bishop of uh, Akita, uh, through a Japanese university, local university, uh, led by a renowned atheist scientist so that no one could accuse the Catholic Church to have mounted the whole thing up with some sort of uh, theatrics or, of sorts. No? So Father Ito, uh, Bishop Ito was very wise. Finally, although at the beginning he was perplexed, uh, Bishop Ito was convinced. But in the meantime, like every true apparition site, Sister Sasagawa, the sisters of the convent of Akita, 
the apparition sites all together, even Bishop Ito, were defamed, criticized, insulted, condemned uh, of all sorts of mediocrity of all sorts. No, accused to have lied and so on and so forth. Mediocrity, as Father Laurentin would say. So Father, or rather Bishop Ito, finally decided to go to Rome and take what you Americans call the red eye, Tokyo, Rome. Took the flight, arrived exhausted, made a rendezvous with his eminence, Cardinal Ratzinger, future Pope Benedict XVI, prefect named as such by His Holiness, Pope John Paul II. But keep in mind that the uh, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger had been bombarded as well with all sorts of defamation against Aguilar. He was also very per perplexed. That is, at the very beginning. But he knew, his experience taught him, do not reach too fast a conclusion. We've seen this before. Let's listen to uh, both sounds of the, of the bell. No, not just the ding, but also the dong. So uh, Bishop Peter arrived and uh, brought him a dossier he carefully prepared. Now he was completely convinced, Bishop Peter, that is and told him and explained to him, showed him all the scientific results, etc. Cardinal Rassichard listened carefully, and, uh, but he was perplexed. Finally, Bishop Ito gave him the last message given by the Virgin Mary to Sister Sasagawa on October 13th, 1973, memory serves, yes. On the 56th anniversary, of the last apparition of Our Lady of Fatima on the anniversary, on the 56th anniversary of the miracle of the sun. And that message, I invite all your viewers to check it on the internet. It's in my book. Mm -hmm. It's nothing less but frightening. If it doesn't reduce your body temperatures by five degrees in less than 10 seconds, then you're stronger than I, because it's frightening. He talks, among other things, of the devil walking amidst the ranks of the cardinals in Rome. He talks of a chastisement that will wipe out a larger part of humanity through a rain of fire. Chastisement that will decimate the world. He talks about uh, God being, yes, a God of mercy, but of God of justice. I invite all of your viewers to check it out on the internet. So when Bishop Ito entrusted the peace the sheet of paper on the hands of Cardinal Ratzinger. He read it. Bishop Ito, feeling that he did not convince the Cardinal, went on, immediately was stopped by the Cardinal Ratzinger and told him, Your Excellency, there will be no need. There will be no further investigation, no further uh, conversation. The matter is closed as of today. Bishop Ito, alarmed, said, your Eminence, but you haven't given me a full chance to explain our situation. Please do listen to me. The Cardinal said, Bishop, it's not necessary. You do not understand. There will be no further investigation, no further conversation, because as of today, the Catholic Church, through the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, will declare formally Akita and the apparition of Sister, through Sister Sasagawa, as being worthy of belief. Bishop Ito immediately, astounded, said, Cardinal, quickly, my heart is racing. You have to explain to me what made you change your position 180 degrees uh, in less than a minute. What was it? Please do tell me. And Cardinal Ratzinger, with a little smirk on the corner of his lips, said, you see, Bishop, this message you just brought me here for this piece of paper is in fact, without either Sister Sasagawa or you knowing, is in fact the third secret of Fatima yeah. and given on the 56th anniversary of the, uh, the apparitions of Our Lady there and on the approval on the miracle of the sun. That is enough for me. You have the seal of approval of Rome as of today. That particular anecdote was echoed by the Bishop Ito himself a few years later, in a marine conference in Geneva, before thousands of witnesses. What I tell you is history, is historical fact, and a confirmation that indeed, what was reported 
on June the year 2000 by Cardinal Bertoni and his uh, colleagues were was nothing less than an incomplete report, purposely incomplete, so as to hide the true message of Akita and of Fatima, which is in no way, shape or form convenient for the clergy, particularly for the hierarchy of the Vatican. So that is the message, the big lines of the great secret of Akita, which today, and, and I accuse publicly the Bishop of Akita today of doing everything in his power to muffle Sister Sasagawa, who is now being forbidden to, dis to discuss the apparitions to writers such as myself, to journalists, uh, or to discuss even the message of October 13th, 1973. I accuse the Church of trying also as well to try to muffle the messages of approved apparition sites to the faithful because of its inconvenience and its accusatory message against the Vatican hierarchy. And she's now, been in total seclusion, hasn't she? She is ordered to silence. I know I tried to contact her and that's what I, I hit my nose against. Now, having said what I said, I want to make it perfectly clear. I am not a fan of, the, of Pope Francis. However, I respect him. He is the Pope de facto. I pray for him. I pray for God assisting him. And God knows that he needs assistance. I pray for the hierarchy of the church. I pray St. Michael the Archangel at the end of every Mass for him to defend the Catholic Church, the institution in the Vatican against the innumerable attacks it's under right now particularly the infiltration within the Catholic Vatican of different lobbies, including, including those of LGBTs, Freemason, Freemason, Freemasonic lodges, and the likes. The Catholic Church, I remind your viewers, is not Rome, it's us. Mm -hmm. We are the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope deserves our respect. I do not agree with Amoris Laetitia because it's it goes against completely, and it's not a subject of interpretation. It goes in every fiber of its conception against the dogma of the faith, mm -hmm. giving communion to um, divorcees, to non-Catholic, even if they're married to Catholics. I disagree completely. I have not swallowed yet the pill of the Pachamama incident, which was nothing short but an incident of sheer idolatry and complicity by allowing pagans to adore a false goddess on Vatican grounds before the witness of, of the Pope with a very fatherly smile. In, from where I come from, this is called complicity. And from where I come from, what has happened on holy grounds was nothing more but pagan idolatry. Period. Absolutely. Nevertheless, Absolutely. Nevertheless, I know that right now, with the incident that is taking place with His Excellency, Bishop Strickland, and the martyrdom he's going through, mm -hmm. a lot of Catholic circles on both sides of the Atlantic are wondering whether the Pope is a legitimate Pope. I would say therefore the following. I have my opinion on the matter. I remain respectful to the institution and the office of the papacy. A few days ago, we had an interview, uh, interview with your friend and your colleague, Jimmy, from Mother and Refuge and uh, Monique Turnbull. And we had uh, Mark Mallet and myself mm -hmm. together. And the same questions were asked. What do you think, uh, Mark and Xavier, about, about the Pope being put into question? Uh, my, response, my response was this. There is a very famous American... Um, a series, a movie called Band of Brothers. I'm sure you know it, yes? It's a story of American soldiers uh, during World War II from the moment of Normandy all the way to the end of World War II. Beautiful story, based on true facts. And at the end of the movie, of the series, there is a part where one of the trainers, who was proven to be a, a lieutenant, most incompetent in the training of troops, was found walking before the troops after the capitulation of Germany 
in front of one of his the men of the officers that he trained, who turned out to become a captain, so he is superior officer. And this lieutenant passed in front of the captain, ignoring him because he was bitter. So, so the captain stopped the lieutenant and said, Lieutenant, or lieutenant, as the Americans say, uh, you have to salute me. And, and, and because we do not salute the man, we salute the rank. No. So he immediately saluted American fashion. And the story ended there. I would say the same thing goes uh, with the matter of the Pope. We respect the office of the papacy, which today, fortunately or unfortunately, is occupied by Francis. So it is the, as far as I am concerned, the office of the papacy that I respect and that I remain loyal to, not the man. If today the church maintains a policy of opening its arms to pagans and to declare a crusade against those who are guilty of the unforgivable crime of wanting to adore Christ the way it's been done for centuries before, as long as liturgy is respected, as long as they can continue to adore and venerate the Holy Sacrament of the altar, the Holy Eucharist, I will continue to respect the position of the church, even if he names men like Fernandez, a bishop of Las Platas in Argentina, the new prefect of the doctrine of the faith, even if you place people like Father James of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, who defends the homosexuals, and uh, um, the, Count, the now Fernandez, who is now the prefect of the doctrine of the faith, who wrote this magnificent book, the Art of Kissing, you know, a book which I've strictly forbidden my two adolescents to read. You know, and he decides to attack men like His Excellency Bishop Strickland because yeah. he is such an exemplary Catholic who does not make any compromises with the doctrine of the faith against all every fiber in my body, in my person. I will continue to respect the office mm -hmm. of the papacy. I, con I condemned, I am totally opposed to his unfair politics, his martyrdom he is inflicting upon just men such as his, uh, his Excellency Bishop Strickland and other council priests. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of Father Pallone, Father Altman, whom I understand. I, I disagree know. with the, the way he responded. I disagree with him. I agree with everything else. He is absolutely right in pointing fingers and accusing those men who have sealed the pact indirectly with the devil. No? But I do not forget that it is the same Vatican that has signed a secret agreement with communist China and which has inflicted such hardship on people like Cardinal Zin, ex-Archbishop of Hong Kong, and many more priests and bishops who are right now hiding underground from communist Chinese police. That's another form of complicity, allowing bishops to dare to take place, to take their place, bishops who have committed the illicit immorality of being married and having illicit children. The list of mediocrity goes on and on. But I will continue to resist this politics of the Vatican with this as my, well, as my sword, with my prayers, my confession, and my re receiving the Holy Eucharist as my shield my faith as my shield, and by my continuing to defend the deposit of the faith the way we are supposed to, I will continue nevertheless to respect and pray for the Pope until, until a new liturgy is brought forth which makes the Holy Eucharist invalid under the pretext of gathering all the other pagan rites and Christian rites and the same chapel under the name of brotherhood when they will start celebrating a Eucharist that is no longer one, at that moment, no longer. In the names of St. Joan of Arc, in the words of St. Joan of Arc, God first served. But until then, I, <laughs> I salute the rank, not the man. 
And I'm with you on that. Um, you know, I think not only uh, the the Vatican is full of wolves, and um, uh, it's it's very difficult sometimes to differentiate between the sheep and the wolves. But we were taught, we were told, you will know them by their fruit. And we see what kind of fruit is coming out of the Vatican right now. We see what kind of fr fruit our, um, our, our Pope is laying before us and who is being persecuted. And um, <clears throat> the righteous are per persecuted. And so, again, I agree. We have to respect the position, the office of the Pope. Um, but we also have to remain vigilant and have uh, to be, uh, uh, you know, Jesus told us to be wise, wise in our dis discernment of people. And, uh, and uh, you know, we can see it. We can see what's coming. I, I, I think I still see it as, as more urgent every single day. And uh, I am so, so grateful that you have come and talked to us about this because everyone needs to have this information. Um, we are told that we will be left with a remnant, a remnant. So when you say 88 people um, in Paris, I believe that's what you said. Um, 88. 88 people. It, 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 that does not shock me because we're talking about a remnant and a remnant is usually a tiny piece, tiny piece. And so we need to be prepared. We have we need to have our souls prepared. We need to have our minds prepared for what's coming because um, as I mentioned before, you know, you you kind of, you know, as we would say in America, you'll be knocked off your block, you know, you'll, you'll just be knocked down by things that you are going to see and hear and experience in the coming weeks and months and years, we don't know. But um, we need to be prepared and we need to have our souls prepared, prepared and our minds prepared for what's to come, uh, because it's going to take an extraordinary uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit to our own souls to be able to uh, navigate it and, you know, survive it, not survive it. I say what, you know, whatever, whatever, um, you know, uh, that we were born as I, I, you know, tell my cynicals, the people I teach all the time, you were born for such a time as this. There is no mistake. There is no, um, you know, just a fluke that we are on uh, the earth at this time. We were born for such a time as this. And God will give us whatever strength, whatever, whatever uh, uh, we need in order to navigate it. Be that in, in, you know, good circumstances or tremendous, tremendous travail, which I believe, you know, we may, we may be seeing very soon. So um, closing thoughts and please, please, please come back. We have so much more to talk about. There's so much more. I have all these questions here. We have so much more to talk about. Well, if you like one day, we, what we could do is a question and answer session. I did that with Joe McLean and mm -hmm. his radio show. We just did that also with uh, uh, with uh, Monique Turnbull on Mother and Refuge. Mm -hmm. I am at your disposal. The important thing is for this message to be brought forth. And I ask everyone to pray for you, Debbie, Thank and you. for your lovely family. And I pray everyone, if it's not any position, please to pray for me and for my family. And um, and I thank you. I have taken two hours of your time. I apologize. I tend to be, I'm renowned to be long-winded. And I for, I ask forgiveness. <laughs> as, am I, as am I. The two of us are really, <laughs> the two of us together could really be dangerous. But, as I'm, but there's so much to talk about. And it's so important. It is urgent. It is urgent. I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Um, Michael Hesseman. Um oh who uh, appeared with me uh, not long ago on Mother and Refuge. And, um, you know, we spoke about some of these things then. And, uh, uh, you know, the church in Germany, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. 
Oh my goodness, that's all I can say. So we have yeah. much more to talk about. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know that our viewers are really, I've just gotten so many comments. And um, uh, I'm, I'm encouraging everyone to please like and share this video. People need to hear this. And, um, you know, our channel is, is small, but, uh, but we have the opportunity to get out to lots and lots of people. So um, if you would, uh, Xavier, uh, send us off with a prayer and be on the lookout, everyone, for our next program. Hi. Well, how about, uh, would it be all right if we pray um, um, Hail Mary in Latin? Would that be all right? Yes. Lovely. And in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, et Mater Nostre, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, Nunc, et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Nomini Patri, et Filio, et Spiritui Santo. Amen. Thank you, Debbie. You've been wonderful. Thank I you. thank your auditors and your viewers. And I have to say, I love comments. Even those who disagree, they, they do it with so much savoir-faire, so much kindness. I am. I, it's a tremendous experience for me. Thank you for everything. Thank you for thank your hospitality. You. Thank you so much. And again, we thank you all, and um, we pray that you will always remain in his will. Mm -hmm.